2. Frederick II. In Frederick II, 1194 to 1250, Hohenstaufen, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Sicily and Jerusalem, we see the statist expression of the dream of unity as it manifested itself in the empire. Frederick, who, among other things, denied the virgin birth and life after death, is held to be a free thinker by many, but he clearly believed in his own divinity. Church order was a necessity to him in order to maintain imperial order, and Frederick took from Innocent III the idea of the Inquisition and put it to his own use to protect the ecclesiastical arm of the empire. In every area, his insistence on imperial control was relentless. The dictum Frederick II placed over his symbolic statue on the Caupian gateway characterizes his mental temper at the time. Quam miseros facio quos variare sio. I shall make miserable those who are variable in spirit. Frederick could speak so openly because he was confident of his divine ordination to enforce unity in terms of imperial justice. A man of great intelligence and practical abilities, he was known as the wonder of the world, thus combining his sense of divine calling with the power to further it. Frederick, whose name meant Rule of Peace, Germanic Friede, Peace, and Rick, Rule, saw himself as the one called to institute a new world order of peace. At his birth, Frederick was hailed as the fulfilment of prophecy, as saviour and world ruler, king of all the world. After he was emperor, Frederick sang the praises of his birthplace in a remarkable document. He called Jesai his Bethlehem, and the Divine Mother who bore him he placed on the same plane as the Mother of our Lord. The background to this thinking was the work of Abbot Joachim of Flora, died 1202, a remarkable figure, possibly of Jewish descent, who grew up in Greek southern Italy, whose influence was extensive in the quote-unquote medieval world, and on Columbus, whose writings were printed in Venice during the Renaissance and Reformation eras and to influence the modern era through Lessing. The modern usage, Middle Ages, probably reflects Joachim's influence. Joachim held to a philosophy of history which was nominally Trinitarian, but actually anti-Christian. History was seen in three ages, one for each member of the Trinity. The first, the Age of the Father, represented the Old Testament and pre-Christian world, the second, or Middle Age, the Age of the Sun, represented the then rapidly waning Christian era. The first was the Age of Creation, the second of Redemption, the third of Universal Peace and Brotherhood, the Age of the Spirit. Frederick announced himself as the one come to fulfil the law, to usher in the Age of Peace. It was Frederick's calling to reduce to peace the peoples by the might of justice, Frederick saw himself as justice incarnate and as the expected messianic king. His letters, when wooing the populace of Rome, are full of the belief that the fullness of time is at hand and the world is about to be renewed. Renewal would mean reconstruction of the world in exactly the state in which it stood at the moment of the redemption in the days of Augustus, the messiah emperor who is expected and who shall set up an empire of justice, must show himself the revivifier of the ancient Roman Empire, the reincarnation of Augustus, Prince of Peace, restoring imperial Rome to her old position in the world. The papacy dreamed of the unity of the world under its dominion. St. Francis preached what closely resembled the Gospel of the Third Age, in that it reduced the Church to a spiritual role and to a poverty that almost implied a surrender of the world to the state, a position some heretical Franciscans later took. Frederick saw the world renewed under the unity of the empire. He saw himself in continuity with the Christian era, but as the creator of the new post-Christian world of peace and unity. His coins, the golden Augustales, had not the slightest Christian sign or symbol. Independent of the Christian gods, there reigns here a Debus, who summons men to faith in him, like a new Caesar Augustus. 
Frederick saw himself as the image of God and mediator of justice between God and man, and as the logos of justice. The emperor must be at once father and son, lord and servants of justicia, infallible in law as the pope was infallible in matters of faith. Phrases that Frederick applied to God were applied to Frederick by his courtiers, as though he were incarnate God. Who bindeth the corners of the earth, and ruleth the elements. Thy power, O Caesar, hath no bounds, it excelleth the power of man, like unto a god. Wear the crown that beseems thy supernatural position. An imperial governor wrote, Our forefathers looked no more eagerly for the coming of Christ than we do for thine. Come to free and to rejoice us. Show thy countenance, and we shall find salvation. This it is for which we groan, this for which we sigh, to rest under the shadow of thy wings. He was hailed as a harbour of salvation to them that believe. He was law incarnate upon earth, and his law code rested on this premise. The emperor taught that the state herself daily begets afresh the only true and valid law of God, that the living law of the temporal world is the living God himself, that the eternal and the absolute must themselves adapt and change with time if they are to remain living. This was a decisive break with the past. This meant that God's primary area was again the imminent world and that the world of time was the great arena of being, the area of determination. The eternal and the absolute must themselves adapt and change with time if they are to remain living, because the truest and fullest presence of God is in time, in the states and in the person of the emperor. God is in time, and in time God is best expressed in the emperor. The third age was the age of this incarnation, and hence the era of peace, because eternity was reconciled with time and the world united under the great Messiah King, the emperor. To deny the empire was to deny world peace and order. It was to deny justice because the eternal order was contingent upon the temporal order and eternity was determined by time. The Wacomite concept was widely held. The 13th century awaited daily, as no other had ever done, the end of the world, and the prophecies foretold the end of the world should be middle and beginning, should be alike redemption and creation. A part of this hope was the idea that the renewal of Rome was necessary for the end of the Middle Age and the renewal of time and beginning of the Third Age. The emperors were the first to seek the renewal of Rome, but they soon had two rivals, the papacy and then the Romans. The Caesar popes of the Middle Ages felt themselves to be the successors of Roman divi, just as much as did the emperors, basing their claim on the forged donation of Constantine. Frederick's state ended in total tyranny, and he became less and less the new Christ, and more and more the Antichrist. The papacy won, only to fall victim to its own departure from its mission and the attendant destruction of Christian Europe. The triumph of imminent power is the death of meaning. God is, he who is, beyond definition, because he is himself the definer and the source of all meaning. The world is meaning because he created it and is separate from it, to the extent that the world is absorbed into God and to the extent that God is absorbed into the world and sovereignty is transferred to the world, to that extent the world loses meaning and becomes undefinable and a mystery. The total triumph of eminence would be the total loss of meaning.